Tantalus Entertainment presents The Killer Score Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Killer Score, where we look at cult classic films with fantastic scores and or soundtracks. I am your host, Dalton Morrison, enjoyer of hot dogs. Yeah. <laughs> and you can find me online at under the handle Sick Jacket Man on Twitter, YouTube content coming soon. I am going to pass the mic down to uh, my other male co host, uh, Richard. Hello, hello, Richard Eckert with Richard's Rad Voices on YouTube under Richard Eckert. Proud to announce that after some major hiccups on my end, I have finally come out with the latest in what I plan to be a line of comic dubs. Go ahead and hop on to YouTube, check out my channel under Richard Eckert to see the first successful dub from Tantalus Entertainment, my voice acting theater troupe slash production posse, to see me and Benjamin Grace of Royal Flush Productions cover the Joker and Lex Luthor's confrontation from The Outsiders Volume 3. Pushing that, we have our third, final, and currently most relevant co-host. Hi, I'm Erin Murray. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Nyer Murray. That's N-I-R-E. There's two different spellings of that for those of you who are interested. You can also find me at witchandcrafts.com. Um, we sell crafty stuff. Uh, crochet, sewing. We're working on a line of bath and body products. Anyway, uh, today is my pick of the movie. And if you listened to the end of the last episode, you would notice that there was a bit of French at the end, which was a bit of a teaser. Uh, we are doing the 2001 French film Amelie. Starring Audrey Tattoo, uh, directed by uh, Jean something Follet. Let me bring it up because I lost. Gerard de Batou? No. <laughs> no, I had this it saved on This is my here. revenge on you for the subtitles. <laughs> uh, Jean Pierre Junet is the name of the director. So this isn't his. This obviously is not his only film. He did another film with Audrey Tattoo called The Very Long Engagement. That one is more of a drama than this. Actually, much more of a drama. I've actually heard of that one. Yeah, it's really good. It's, um, that one is, like, a love story set during, I think, World War One or World War II. Oh. I can't remember. Interesting. Um, I watched it back in high school. Um, Marion Cotillard is in that. But anyway, back to the movie at hand. We're doing the film Amelie, which is one of my favorite films. It was actually my introduction to... I wouldn't say foreign films in general, but to a different type of foreign film. This one is meant to be more of a comedy. Um, a little bit of a romantic comedy in a way, but it's a lot of fun. It's very quirky. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It The way best way to describe it is it's very, very French. <laughs> um, the thing with this is that the score itself is very French. You hear... For example, you hear like accordions a couple times, well, probably more than a couple times, um, but you hear some like traditional sounding French music that people associate with France. Um, there's also some, there's also, it takes place in Montmartre in Paris, which I, don't ask me what number arrondissement is because I can't remember, it's been way too long. And basically follows a young woman named Amélie Poulain who is going out of her way to help as many people as possible, and it's a really cute and fun movie. Anything either of you would like to put in? Yes, actually. it. My non-existent relationship with this film is pretty funny, considering a few things. One, I distinctly remember the theater shot of her sitting down and looking awestruck at the screen, being referenced in one of my textbooks for screenwriting and cinematography back in college. And 
I remember wanting to see the rest of that, but never getting around to it. Weirdly enough, however, I do have some experience with the director. And the one big thing of his that I have seen, and people probably know him for, unfortunately, is Alien Resurrection. Oh, I saw that, but not this. <laughs> have either of you seen that? Nope. Resurrection? Alien Resurrection. Oh, that's the really shit one. No, I yeah. haven't seen that. <laughs> oh. You you say it's the really shit one. That doesn't do it any justice, though. It but. also doesn't narrow it down nowadays, sadly. Yeah, there's a lot of Alien... I don't want to say a lot, but between that and Prometheus, you're like... And uh, Alien Covenant. And Alien Covenant, you're like, why are you still making movies about this? I still kind of like Prometheus. Oh, what? what? Kinda. I was it's like, it's the most pointless film ever. It's like we're gonna do a covenant to alien. exists. It's a film where scientists don't know the atmosphere of the planet they're on, and they just casually take off their helmets. I just have a loony sense of humor. Okay, let's move on, please. Okay. <laughs> it has the rock scene. I will turn this into a run and get. <laughs> ah, God damn it. You will not Just stop run me. Sideways. Just you will run not stop sideways. me. <laughs> I saw Prometheus in theaters, and then I got a message from my friends on Facebook saying, "Hey, do you get this movie?" And I tried to bullshit and answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's up its ass. It is, but <laughs> we're allowed to have our guilty pleasures. Some of us take masochistic, bizarre pleasure in seeing complete abortions of science. Like me. Honestly, my going back to Amelie, my biggest experience with the film is, like, I remember being, like, a little kid and back when we would still go to video stores. I just remember seeing the cover of the film a lot on, on shelves and, like, Blockbuster and just yeah. being like, oh. <laughs> uh, the first time I watched this movie was actually in my high school French class. And, well, actually, no, it was actually in the French club because there was no way we were going to be able to watch this in uh in during actual school hours without oh, yeah. getting in trouble. It's an R-rated movie. There's some nudity and sex scenes. Um, ah. And there's no way you can show that during school hours, mm -hmm. especially with how bullshit my high school was. <laughs> <laughs> I like how it's like, this is a feel-good movie. Real light. Also nudity. In the first five minutes. <laughs> Yay! But it's not meant to be sexy or anything. It's just like, this is baby. Not like a baby, but it's like, this is like a woman who is pregnant showing her pregnancy while she's naked. You ever have that moment where you just think to yourself, a lot of my family is going to learn a lot about me in the midst of this podcast. Like, between this and my whole runaways thing from the rock and roll episode. <laughs> I, I'm just glad that my dad is the only one in my family who knows what a podcast is and he doesn't care. <laughs> Uh, but, yeah, I've seen the cover numerous places, and this movie is apparently a... Is it pretty influential? Yeah, like, if there's anything to be taken from the aforementioned textbooks that I've have reference shots from this movie, it's a gold mine of uh, exemplary shots that people use to demonstrate things. Yeah, yeah, and another thing I was going to mention is the this movie came out in 2001 and takes place in 1997. Um, I believe it's 97? They they say it in the movie, but I can't remember. It basically it takes place like the day Princess Diana died. Um, Jesus. And the day after. At, like the following days after Princess Diana. Because um, in, in the beginning of the... Um, movie like you see uh, uh there's you just hear on the background like in the news tv about like the death of princess diana in paris but that's like it gets referenced a few th throughout the movie but it's not like a main point of the movie princess diana is not a main point of the movie it's just like this just happens to happen at the same time it's like a framing device it's a framing device yeah but yeah i don't know about Either of you, but I'm fairly excited for this. I mean, yeah. considering the legacy. Um, 
I actually saw a couple articles when I was looking for ways to stream this movie saying how big and influential uh, the way of filmmaking that this that this film uses. Um, anything ranging from... There are some scenes where it uses a wide-angle lens. There's also... Um, there's also one of my favorite scenes is when... Well, you'll you'll see it if you watch the movie, is she's watching TV and, like, she's seeing herself in the TV. Not, like, hallucinating or anything like that, just, like, how strong her imagination is. Mm. Just imagining herself on TV. So, basically, Dalton will get this. She was Ichiban Kasuka before Ichiban Kasuka was a thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't really have much else to say without giving away spoilers. Are you guys excited to see one of my fav favorite French films? Yeah. Always. Always, yay. Okay, so let's get started and we will catch you on the flip side. And we are back. We just finished watching the film Amelie. Uh, it's one of my top tier movies um but i want to know what you guys think uh richie you said you had some things to say about it let's start with you all right so one thing i want to say is that this movie wears its heart and its influences on its sleeves and they are all played out to stylized perfection i'll get to what i mean by that in a little bit but really long story short is I love this movie. It is just... It, it's a perfect storm of funny, heartwarming, and adorable, honestly. That's the main takeaway. I could eat this movie up. <laughs> <laughs> that came out wrong. But, uh, Dalton, save me some face here, brother. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. I thought this was a very cute, very sweet film. I really, really enjoyed it. I don't know if it's the first French movie I've seen. It's definitely the first movie I've seen that's entirely in French. I've probably seen films made by French directors before, though. I mean, one of my favorite directors is French-Canadian, and that probably just angered a bunch of <laughs> any French people who were in the audience. Yeah, like all three of them. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, I'm gonna get. we're going to get very angry comments in French. <laughs> That reminds me of something I saw recently where somebody was discussing how in uh, Tolkien's correspondence letters, he modeled the elves after the French. And people said, wait, does that make the orcs Quebecois? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like poutine's back on the menu, boys. <laughs> Uh, I mean, when you look at how the rest of Canada treats Ke Quebec, Quebec and the Quebecois, it's, it's like, I, I think it was the Switch that had, like, a an option where it was, like, what what part of, of, uh, of, Fran of like, Canada are you in? Quebec? Not Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I just want to say... Take yeah. the, I just need to take it for a second. Yeah. Dalton said this was probably going to be short. We're already bringing it off the rails by talking <laughs> about Quebec. And the switch. And I was going to say about... <laughs> uh, there actually is a very fleeting character of Marguerite, who is from Quebec in the beginning of this movie. Oh, yeah. The jumper. <laughs> <laughs> she, oh, my God. She couldn't live with being from Quebec. <laughs> um, she probably went to France and was like upset, disappointed. upset how much everyone was bullying her, or looking at her horrified and couldn't understand her. Oh my god. Um. So, this is I I pitched this movie to you guys as being very cute and quirky and fun. It does have some dark moments, yeah. like Marguerite the Jumper. <laughs> I just realized something, by the way. What? Uh, you have a funny. Quebec story you can relate to uh, the audience involving your friend Chantal from France. Oh god. <laughs> okay, so my bestie lives in France. Uh, hi Chantal, <laughs> if you're listening in on this. Um, and Dalton and I were once watching a video of we were once watching a video of uh, the best friend speaking Quebecois and 
Dalton asked me to translate because I took French in high school. I'm I'm barely making out like I got like three words out of it. I sent it to Chantal who speaks French and she's like, What the fuck is this? <laughs> this is not French, what are you doing? <laughs> um anyway. So I'm trying not to get into spoiler territory. Um if if you want to watch this movie, it's available on, like, Blu-ray and DVD. You can get it on Amazon. Um, it's not on Amazon Prime. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, we got a copy of it. But anyway. Um, I love the filmmaking in this. It's very cute and quirky, but also has... it The use of Dutch angles, the use of the wide-angle lens used artistically. Specifically enhancing the word artistically and when it comes to wide-angle lenses it's a big deal because the thing with wide-angle lenses is that in American films they get so overused and used in the wrong scenes and it's so incredibly frustrating. Like, it's clear that everyone using wide-angle lenses is just trying to be Tim Burton and failing. Like, even for good movies it's a problem like that film adaptation of a series of unfortunate events. That's an entertaining enough movie, but- It's not great. It's not great. Um, and the Netflix series is like ten times better. But um, Let's face it, though. Jim Carrey was born to play Olaf. He was. Like, he was good. Yeah. But he, that the filmmaking of that movie was so obnoxious, it though. It really was. Like, and especially with the wide-angle lens when it comes to kids' movies in, like, the 90s and early 2000s, as we mentioned, things like the, uh, like, series of unfortunate events. Other movies, for example, like, Babe, A Pig in the City used it a lot. Another one was Matilda used wide-angle lenses a lot. But, like, you saw wide-angle lenses used for, like, weird comedic things. Ah, yes. And it's so bad. Babe, A Pig in the City, the other George Miller movie. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it was used in Babe, too, but I remember from the second movie. Um... But other things like Dutch angles, shaky cam, are all used in a really good way. I love the scene when they're on when Amelie is taking the metro, and she's um, for those of you who aren't aware, that's also known as a subway. Yeah. Uh, she's on the subway, and the lens gets all shake. The camera itself gets all shaky while the train is moving, which works out perfectly because if you ever tried to take a video on a moving train, yeah. it's not easy at all. Uh, son of Philadelphia speaking here. You cannot stand without being sh- shaken around by the train if you're on the subway. Like, it's impossible. Yeah. You can't keep your footing, at least not 100%. And the way they use shaky cam conveys that feeling so well. And I think the best part is it doesn't overstay its welcome because, hey, subway trips are pretty quick fleeting things if there's one thing that i wish had happened in this movie is the character of joseph getting more of a comeuppance because <laughs> that guy's a fucking ins- well i can't really call him an incel because he did get laid once in the movie um he was an he incel up had sex before he definitely had sex before but he's just so obnoxious and gross and creepy and i'm just like I, re- I really hope someone had, like, literally booted him out of the cafe. Or, like, well, paddled his ass out of the cafe. <laughs> well, they had to have an accurate representation of the average Frenchman in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to apologize. I can say that. I got French ancestry. Fuck off. <laughs> I, Another episode in which we insult our have listeners. Pe- yeah, we're I still going to have people after us. Eventually. I can I, feel I've got, it. Look, I've got so many flags on me at this point that I might as well collect them all. The, <laughs> Are the, they like Pokemon to you? Yes. Oh my god. The French, the Marvel stands. Don't you... Oh, another one was going to talk about Near Dark, and I said uh, the Midwest is still stuck in the 70s. <laughs> hey, you guys have good emo music. That's... <laughs> <laughs> and no wonder. Hey. You, look, you're in the Midwest. Hey, hey, hey. There's not much to do. You got stuff you know to else? be depressed about. You know what else they have? They got good bluesy bands like the Black Keys. That's Ohio's true. got the Black Keys. Yeah. And Scott the Wasp. Yeah. I was also going to say uh, Jack White is from Michigan. Yep. Yeah. Bunch of the 
kind of bluesy stuff came out of there. Yeah. Uh, I want to say Cage the Elephant, but I think they're from no, California. No, they're from Seattle. You huh. know, you want to I wasn't too far funny? off. You want to hear something really funny? What? The French are so goddamn dirty that they actually had to clean up every single location that they used for this film. That make that actually makes sense from what I've heard about how bad Paris is. Honestly, from yeah. Chantal, because she said because when because the way you have to fly is you go to Charles de Gaulle, and then you either take a train or fly to wherever you're going. For where she was going, she was just like half this neighborhood smells like body odor. <laughs> See, I was gonna say when those scenes in the metro happen, and I was they like, walk. This is very clean. I was gonna yeah. say. This is either her imagination spot or yeah. or clearly clean for the film because there's no way any metro would be that clean. Oh god no. No, unless I you're said in... it probably still smelled like piss. No, unless you're in like an Asian metro station. True. Yeah. True. True. They're all about cleanliness though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you ever see you ever seen like actual footage of like Japanese train stations? It's like my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, let's talk about the cinematography some more, because, um, like Aaron said, there is... What makes them use so well is their uh, timing and how sparingly they're used. Yeah. Like, no shot in this movie overstates its welcome. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that is, is because this movie is taking a lot of pages out of... Federico Fellini's book mm -hmm. clearly because something I'm going to mention if we ever cover one of his movies, wink wink, is mm -hmm. that he specialized in magical realism. Yeah. And this movie is very much an example of that. Oh yeah, this movie sorry. Uh, this movie is definitely an example of magical realism um, because there's scenes in the movie where at first you were like what's going on is so-and-so hallucinating or something it's like no it's just her imagination she they establish it very early in the movie she has a strong imagination because she didn't really have friends as a kid yeah um and they play a lot with color and cinematic framing in multiple instances of this a lot of good use of early 90s cg too to give it that atmosphere well this came out in 2001 ah whoops I was still, gonna say, this early nineties because Princess Diana. Still, early CG. Yeah. Still, like in the phase where they were making it look less like plastic. Yeah. But it's used to good effect, like stuff like the statues, for instance. Or the paintings when they're moving. The paintings, and oh, the, the pig lamp! I want that lamp. Oh yeah, that's a cool lamp. Uh, and other things too, like uh. Like, how they play with color, like I said, all those Zorro shots, where they mm -hmm. take it to black and white like it was in the Disney serials. And another thing I was going to mention when it comes to color was a scene where um, she helps the blind man get to the train station, and everything just turns yellow when he looks up at the sky. Yeah, to convey the fact that he's not seeing this, it's being conveyed to him by Amelie. Yeah. Uh... A lot of great use of sepia and retro black and white stylings. And speaking of black and white stylings, one thing I mentioned, one thing I wanted to say was that, um, it, like, like I said in the middle of recording, was that Audrey Tatu? Yes, Audrey Tatu. Tatu. Um, clearly owed a lot from silent film actors or really expressive actors like Charlie Chaplin and bring it back to Fellini, Giletta Massina, mm -hmm. who she she has the same really wide-eyed expression and rubbery facial movements. Also, another thing I want to mention is that um, <clears throat> Amelie's style and Audrey Tattoo's style in this movie is very... If you're familiar with the term gummine, yep. it's very much that. Very much gummine. If you don't know what gummine is, go watch Roman Holiday. So, uh, <laughs> for reference, this is Giletta Messina. Oh, yeah. Who starred Giletta in... Messina. Giletta Messina. Sorry. That's uh, um, Julieta. Julieta Messina. I cannot... Yeah. I... Hey, Ronnie. 
hi, here's another instance of me sucking at Italian. <laughs> but you can see the you can see the influence there. Mm-hmm. Like they got the same baby eyes. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I could definitely see it. Another thing I wanted to mention is not so much like the hairstyling or anything like that, but just like the way that she's portrayed gives it a little bit of like an Audrey Hepburn feel, like oh, an early yeah. Audrey, like early Audrey Hepburn, like Roman Holiday era. Not yeah. Like, not like My Fair Lady or Breakfast at Tiffany's. I'm saying like the earlier stuff she did. She's got the same bob cut too. Yeah, and she's got the, like, that same style to her. That expression, that expression and style to her. Kind of very Yeah, that that Audrey Hepburn gummy feel. Yeah. Um. As for the music. Oh yes, we gotta talk about the music. We do. As I mentioned before, it's very very French. A lot of use of pianos and accordions. Oh yeah. One thing I was going to mention when we were talking about how French the score was is. What I was the one who brought up pianos mm -hmm. because one movie that loves pianos is a French animated movie that I really love. It's called Ernest and Celestine. Oh yeah, I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Um, another thing I want to mention is if you're into French animated short films, there's a YouTube channel called Goblins. It's spelled like Goblins with an E. Yeah. They do French animated short films and they're really good. So yeah, um, Ernest and Celestine's soundtrack popped to mind with all the ambient pianos. Very, uh, very Baroque, if that's a term. It's no, more very romantic. More romantic. By the way, Dalton, shout out to you. That was another film dubbed by G Kids. Oh. Yeah. Um, oh. Ernest and Celestine. It had, uh, Forrest Whitaker as the bear. Oh, cool. Did he, did the bear take people to the Matrix? Oh, that's Lawrence Fishburne. That's Lawrence Fishburne, you it's jackass. It's not even Forrest Whitaker. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm tired, all right? I I, I, I had a late night last night. <laughs> <laughs> you also had three cans of pep sorry, two cans of Pepsi and a G Fuel. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. for... That's why I'm kind of quiet on this episode. I mean, I, I just like the film, but I'm, tr I'm struggling to think of stuff to say about it. If you guys want to hear about the Ghost concert, I can fill you in on yeah, that. Yeah, for context... <laughs> Our... Dalton didn't get home until, like, what, one thirty last night? Yep. Uh, I got back around, like, midnight-ish, but I didn't get to sleep till like, 1 in the morning. Yeah, because you came into the bedroom at, like, 1 o'clock, and I'm like, uh, what time is it? And you're like, it's 1. Ghost concert was great, though. <laughs> yeah. It I'm was. Like, okay. It was. They were great. They were great. I imagine... I imagine you walking through the hallway like fucking Johnny Depp and Dead Man, just like... How you doing? <laughs> Just like... I will say one thing. Uh, Volbeat as was as I expected them, very middle of the road. I don't understand how Volbeat is such a popular band. What, what were they the opening act? Uh, no, the opener was actually this really neat band called Twin Temples, which is actually styled as a satanic doo wop band. Interesting. Yeah, but Volbeat it it's Volbeat. It sounds like radio rock music. What, what what can I say? Oh, oh, he's awake now, people. What can but I say? He he's got the look. He he's got the same look again. We got him. <laughs> we got him back. Look, we look, people come to this podcast or take some films. I sincerely doubt they want me to hear me talk about but, uh, satanic how... doo wop music. <laughs> well, no, they probably like that. I sincerely d hear, doubt they'd like to hear me talk about how like. Lola Martez is the most like middle of the road song ever, and I'm like every time I listen to a Volbeat song, I'm like I'm like okay, what when do I hear the all new Jeep Cher Jeep Grand Cherokee in stores? <laughs> <laughs> you see, speaking of Jeep Grand Cherokee, I still have the CD we bought at that record store. Oh that yeah, was just, <laughs> yeah, that the was Jeep. Just commercial music for the Jeep Grand Cherokee. <laughs> I still want to find a place that still has a CD player, like hook up to a sound system, and put the Jeep thing in it, so people are hearing the 1996 Jeep Grand, Grand Cherokee. Cherokee. I just want to say too, the people who don't come here for these rants are philistines, because I live for this. Oh. Like, killer scores like, it's half like half film, half ranting. Half film, half seeing Dalton 
have the veins pop out of his forehead like he's seeing Dalton manifest like, whatever comes from his mind like goblin he's, power. It's like he's fucking Tetsuo Shima. <laughs> but in all seriousness though, uh I'm sure he got I'm like Sherlock if the Mind Palace had a bunch of little goblins in it just going <laughs> In all seriousness though, I'm sure he got some favorite character in this movie or somebody you'd like to talk about talk about oh yeah no um i love the glass man i I love how he's not like not once do they show his like uh disability affecting him in like a really negative light you know they bring it up but like he's not like shown as like weak and he's just shown as like a deliberately reclusive because like he just doesn't like most people yeah yeah and there's something kind of Yoda-ish about him as far as, like, yeah. movie mentors go. Uh, yeah, I love him. He's such a sweet man. I love how he's always giving snacks to people and stuff. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's just so nice. But there's also kind of an edge to him. Like, you you look at movie mo- mentors like Mr. Miyagi. Yeah, they've got their impish moments, but, you know, they're sweethearts. Uh, the gl- Oh, Mr. Miyagi doesn't have edge to him? Not like this guy. Mr. Miyagi was, like... A trained killer, Richie. What the fuck was I talking about? I just... Oh, yeah, a World War II veteran. Yeah, he was part of a regiment and got the Medal of Honor, Richie. Now which one of us is the sleepy one today? <laughs> I guess I'm the one who's off base. Not to mention one of his first moments in the film is beating up teen- teenagers. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. Back to the glass man. <laughs> but, like... Back to Raymond Duvall. I'm... I'm more talking about Sorry, his Kyle. relationship to people. Yeah. Like, I'm not... When I said the whole Mr. Miyagi thing, he was more, like, outwardly jovial. This guy wears his... Cynicism on his sleeve. Yeah. yeah. that You get me now, right, D? Yeah. Man, that scene, though, in the, the first Karate Kid movie, when you see him crying, mm. like, drinking, that's, that's powerful stuff. That... I went ahead and looked up stuff about that, and... People make fun of Pat Morita's accent because, yeah, it is kind of exaggerated. But I found out something. Yeah, he actually based it off the fight choreographer for the movie's accent. Yeah. Um, his... It's an Okinawan accent yeah. in particular. Mm-hmm. And Which he... Which is where the character yeah. Miyagi is from. Mm-hmm. But I do like the glass man. Lucian is cute, too. I, I like that yeah. guy. Yeah. He's, he's a klutz... And there are times where his absent-mindedness does actually go a bit too far. But you get the sense that he doesn't mean any of it. Mm-hmm. And he's a hard worker. I like the, yeah. uh, I like the, um, the very surly uh, cafe ladies in this film. <laughs> oh, um... Suzanne, I think it is? There was Suzanne, Georgette, Georgette and Gina. Yeah, I, I like how I like how like surly the other two, aside from Georgette, are. Yeah, <laughs> they're just like you need to like eat shit, motherfucker, and it's just like I like the, I like these girls. Yeah, everyone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Aaron had brought it up. Uh, Lucian has yeah, he's a he's a ditz, and he's very meticulous in how he works, which gets him made fun of by a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Which made me think, possibly, and I've got personal experiences both with myself and other people, so uh, I'm not just trying to generalize here. I have reason to believe that he may or may not be on the autism spectrum. Yeah, there's actually been some debate among fans of the, um, fans of Amelie, like, whether or not he is autistic. I have, when I was doing research into this movie, which, let's be honest, there's not a ton of research, I was able to dig from it, outside, well, not in production, at least. But, um, for the character of Lucien, uh, some people have actually, the actor himself hasn't said anything, but some people have actually, like, openly asked, like, is this character on the spectrum? Hmm. Like, there's, there's some familiarity on my end. You know, uh, autistic guy here who has spent a lot of his work and school life around other people on the spectrum, and he shows some some symptoms of, uh, you know, 
being having some sort of autism spectrum thing about him like mm-hmm. he's there's his meticulous painstaking way of doing his job there's the fact that he doesn't really have that much of a filter mm-hmm. um and there's just his whole bearing like he's earnest like y- you just get the sense that he has some he's trying yeah he's trying <laughs> he's kind of like hashtag relatable <laughs> We're all trying. We we do. Like we like do. I said in the scene where it's like uh where he goes, Ah yes, but what uh where the glass man says, Ah yes, but what what of uh looking to oneself to clean up their own mess? And I was like, Oh Alright You and, go in there, movie? <laughs> and then you got the author dude who was like, Life is just a series of drafts that are never a hundred percent realize even if they are realized they're not what were planned yeah. and these are all paraphrasing <laughs> yeah because that's you know. a good one that's a good one i love the author the failed author guy oh he's a badass yeah yeah, yeah. uh crap what was his name um i almost huh. said hidalgo no that's not it i hate with an h i hate you for it but i will put up subtitles for it yeah. Uh, I'll put a little caption saying who it is. Yeah, yeah, we can look that up later. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, I love you guys. Um, What else can we talk about? Uh, we talked about the music. It's very, very French with use of pianos, accordions, traditional French film you scores. You could slap the music over that terrible scene in, uh, Bi- in uh, Bioshock uh, where, they, where they're telling, look, it's France. And they literally have a, a tiny boy dancing. Infinite? Yeah, an infinite. And the, the, the thing they show you to indicate it's for, uh, France is a cobblestone street with a little French boy dancing around holding a baguette over his head. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. everyone's like, oh, well, it's Elizabeth's idealized version of, uh, vision of France. And I'm like, it still looks stupid and I'm going to make fun of it. Yeah. God, I wanted to like that game so much. <laughs> Seriously. The the most interesting thing in that game is like since it does take place from an alternate reality in our own when we see like France, what it actually is, there's a cinema marquis and it says, um, Revenge of the Jedi. Oh uh, That's cool. Yeah, that is cool. Good yeah. detail to show it's an alternate universe. It needed to be a fucking point and click adventure though. It needed it to be It would have been so much better as a It needed to be yeah. something like maybe Kind if of te- you took that gunplay though and put it in a different game, that would be a very good video game. It would be. <laughs> it needed to be like Telltale or or like the guys who made Road ninety six though. I love I lo- I do love the gunplay in that game though. It's the best in the series. Kinda. Yeah. I wish they didn't force me to pick up health to restore it in the middle of those frantic action scenes. That- like never play Doom, Richie. No, 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 no. That's different. How? Well, Doom guy is more durable than a stale soda cracker. That that's one thing. Clearly, but, you've never played on ultra violence. I haven't. Well, there you go. <sighs> Side note: play it on ultra violence so that Dalton can just. I'm just saying, picking up health is a much more common shooter trope than it used to be, than it is nowadays, because, like, it used to be the standard you'd pick up health to restore. That was what it was in the first Halo game, and people forget that. Fair enough. The point is, even that game's shield systems had more durability, though. You didn't get cut down in seconds. You know, I like Spyro, too. That's a good game. <laughs> you know, I that's one of my favorites. I haven't played it, but uh, Colin uh, has the somewhat uh, controversial opinion that he believes the best Bioshock gameplay-wise is actually Bioshock Two. I mean, the gameplay was probably one of the better parts of that, to be honest. Yeah, like he, he said it. It get, he said he felt like the game gets a little too much flack. He found things interesting about it, and he really enjoys the gameplay. There are ideas in it. Like, I get where he's coming from. Like, the ideas that game has are good ideas. 
I don't hate the idea of playing as like a weird forgotten model, the big daddy. You know? That yeah, that's cool. Yeah. But I have a Bioshock story. Oh yeah. Oh okay. It involves getting hit in the head with a hammer. What? <laughs> huh? Please elaborate. <laughs> okay. So back when I was in high school doing um, amateur filmmaking and doing uh, reviews on YouTube with my with one of my friends, with my friend Sammy. Hi, Sammy. Um, <laughs> we were doing a review of Bioshock 1 and 2 right before Bioshock Infinite was supposed to come out. And I was dressed as a guy whose name I can't remember, the guy giving the whole speech at the beginning of Bioshock. And I was Jack? Supposed- no, the guy who created... Andrew Ryan. Andrew Ryan, thank you. I was dressed as Andrew Ryan. I had... I literally had, like, eyeliner on my face. Huh. Um, I think I know where this is going. Yeah. Keep going. So, <laughs> so, Sammy, I'm sorry for telling this story. It's just funny looking back on it now. I know you still feel bad. Um. Anyway. So, the scene was supposed to end with... A cutting right before, like, she comes up to me dressed, like, in, like, 1940s or 50s dress and all this stuff with a hammer. And she was supposed to, it was supposed to stop. We were supposed to cut right before she was about to hit me. She hit me in the head with a hammer. Oh. <laughs> were you doing the whole A Slave Obey scene? I can't remember. All I know is, like, it was the This is Rapture speech. And she was like, ah! and we were supposed to cut right there and got bonk. What bank? Uh, with a hammer. So, returning a bit. Speaking of retro stylings, I like how this movie has those aforementioned callbacks to the movies of Fellini and Charlie Chaplin without being too on the nose about it. Yeah, yeah. Any movie can do the whole Pleasantville thing and just sort of dial it up and be like, hey, can you tell? This movie was influenced by really artsy films, but but this movie is the type of enthusiastic tributes that gets you to love its source material without being too obvious about its influences. And, and, and it's not too pretentious either because of the whole slice of life angle. True, true. Um, it's not meant to be as... Richie just said, like, it's not meant to be pretentious. It's not supposed to be taken too, too seriously. At its core, it's a quirky romantic comedy with its dark moments and with, um, and, like, it's cute. It's meant to be a cute, fun little comedy. It is, as Aaron and Dalton have said, very, very French. It's also very, very French. (laughs) If you want to see a French drama film, uh, that's so subtle it hurts... Watch Commune Image. It's another film I watched in high school French club. Dalton seems to be doing something to contain his giddy laughter. I just saw something really funny someone sent me. Oh. Yeah. Just something on Twitter? Yeah. I don't don't (laughs) care to elaborate. (laughs) Okay. He's got the gremlin grin again. One day, once we raise enough money on our Kofi link... One one actually, day we'll set up a camera for this bastard. Okay, I I won't be as much of a gremlin. It was it was a uh, a gift someone composited of like an old Japanese TV news report where it was like showing how Nintendo was gonna discontinue the GameCube and focus on the Wii. Except the way the news report chose to illustrate this was like a a, a model of Mario coming in to some children playing the GameCube and kicking the <laughs> GameCube to hand them a Wii. And you said we wouldn't have enough content. You said this would be a shorter one, but we are already approaching it. And we still could keep... There was still one angle I wanted to get to about the incel dude. Oh, Joseph. Joseph, yes. Did you just stab? No, I was like... He was doing the whole fire away thing. Oh. I, I can dab if you'd like. Do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, let's like, And I'd also like to thank you, in spite of the fatigue, for carrying on the tradition of diatribes. Killer score could it's be short. My blood. We could be concise, but we do this for you. We choose not to be concise. Yeah. We we choose to talk we about choose every rapture. Ow. Yeah, imagine imagine me hitting the sickest dab for when I dab. 
because I did hit. The we'll get a setup down. eventually once we stop being broke ass. I know. I know. I'm just saying. I want them to picture it. You know. Please donate to our Kofi. Wink. <laughs> Give me money, please. <laughs> Give me money so we can get a better setup. <laughs> Give me money. I promise I won't spend it on Crystal Pepsi and Crystal Pepsi related merchandise. Give me money. I promise I won't spend it on Crystal Meth. You see, I know I won't spend it on anything because I don't want anything. I just want to stop pivoting my wrist around so we can hear everybody. <laughs> I just want a boom mic stand. Yes. Dalton, I, w I will punch you. <laughs> This this this, put him up, put him up. this this motherfucker's back here talking about how much work I do. How we doing, Miss Queensboro? <laughs> He's, He's back right here. Now. He's back here. I'm pivoting the mic around. He's like, oh, Richie. Oh, uh, my little gay wrist turns. I'm gonna fucking end you. <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing, but it's. <laughs> oh. Hey, put your hand for my face and so you expect me not to bite it. Uh. What are you a what are you a dog? You are <laughs> clearly no, he's a gremlin. You I'm gonna lose a finger to your jaw. I'm the gremlin that just it ran, wasn't I'm the grand gremlin that just randomly shoots the other gremlin and is like <laughs> It wasn't supposed to be literal, you bitch. Hey, I was the kid who got in trouble for biting people. Quick, what gremlin are you? Whatever the gremlin is that is the receiving end of all the slapstick jokes and has to regenerate. You ever see Duckman? Oh, it's the doofy gremlin in the second one. That's that's the one yeah. you would do that. You ever see You ever see Duckman? No. No. I'm the two little teddy bears who get beat up on a regular basis only to regenerate for this for the sake of coming back. Oh, you know what I realized? To be beat on. I am totally the gargoyle gremlin. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That tracks. Yeah. But does that make me female gremlin? Because I'm the only girl here. I could be electric gremlin. I could be electric gremlin. Yeah. So, getting back to what I was saying about uh, what was the gentleman's name? Joseph. Joseph, and uh, I believe Bubbles? Georgette. Georgette was uh the tobacconist. Yeah. Tobacco lady. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I think is a real testament to this movie's strength is that it made a romance between them believable. And then it broke it apart. <laughs> but it still made it believable. It I'm did. like, in the middle of those scenes, I looked at Aaron and I'm like, Aaron, is this movie. Going to put together the two most obnoxious characters? Yes. Yes, is it, it will. Is it going to work? It kind of did. Kind of, sort of, kind of. Like. It plays out in a pretty realistic manner, all things considered. That's another thing I like about this movie is how it walks a really tenuous but delicate line between the innocent and the raucous. The dirty. Bring well, the motherfucking raucous. So bring it on. So bring it on. Thank you, Dalton. You're welcome. Um, but... It's, like, innocent and stuff, but it's not childish. Oh, no, this is, like... I'm like, oh, this is all There's whimsy. Nudity. Yeah, there is. There's quite well, a bit. Mm -hmm. I came in for, like... uh, I came in for this light, whimsical thing. I came in for Hugo, and it gave me, like... And it gave me Nino... And it gave you Nino working in a porn shop. Yeah. yeah. And it gave me the aforementioned dysfunctional couple banging in the bathroom. Yeah. So... Hey, it happens. I got an idea. If you guys don't have much more to say about the film, how about we end it by talking about... Uh, each person says what their favorite scene was. Okay. Sure. Let's, yeah. that, that's a good... Yeah. Because I feel like we'll all have just enough to say about it. Yeah. Yeah. So... My favorite scene, just because it's so cute and adorable, is the scene where... Uh, Nino shows up at Amelie's apartment and it's like, oh, you guys are being so cute because she's so painfully shy mm -hmm. which is something I can relate to. <laughs> um, but when he shows up the door and she answers the door and, like, she just pulls him in and you expect it to be, like, some super sexual thing or anything like that, but it's just, like, just gently kissing each other, like, everywhere but the mouth and it's like, oh, that's cute. Very tasteful. 
Yeah. And then, of course, it leads into... And it leads into them banging, so... Like, it's very... It's a very good use of silence, too. Oh, yeah. Because no music, mm -hmm. no dialogue, just the gentle... Just the gentle sounds of lips touching faces. Yep. And it's played out to adorable perfection. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite scene is probably the... Well, not probably. Definitely the scenes where Amelie gaslights the grocer. Oh, Her I love that. When he gaslights gatekeep girl... Um, gaslight gate, gatekeep girl boss... Colignon. Yeah, like, that was good. He, he is an abusive dick to Lucien for a good portion of the movie and just not a great dude in general, unless it's to Amelie and only occasionally. And so she decides to mess with his apartment, essentially. Um, and not in the obvious way. She doesn't trash it. She changes tiny little things like giving a dead light bulb to one of his lamps and uh screws up the electricity changes his slippers to be a smaller size reverses yeah. the doorknob in his bathroom changes his uh mm -hmm. speed dial numbers around so that when he tries to call his mom to get advice it gives him a psychiatric helpline <laughs> that's brilliant like the um, when she messes with the electricity in his room with the light bulb, so it always hums. Yeah, and so and then when he pl plugs the plug in the lamp, it blows up because yeah. she put a she put a, a wire, uh, she put a needle through the wire. Like, yeah, the whole pl thing plays out like a, uh, which would work by the way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The whole thing plays out like a John Hughes movie, but much more restrained. Yeah, where he's just like slowly coming to the realization that someone's fucking with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, especially it, all the exaggerated stuff in there but my favorite part in, in particular of that is when he's swatting at his doorknob yeah <laughs> like he's like wait this is this isn't normal yeah this, this, this is, isn't right she this, just switched the doorknob around yeah. it's like this is like clockwork for me what the hell oh also uh -oh. making him wake up two hours earlier than he has to. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Um, okay, I guess finally, um, I guess favorite? my favorite scene, uh, I think it's probably the scene when uh, her dad receives the latest series of photographs of his gnome. Uh, early when he doesn't know what to do in his life, Amelie suggests travel since he's retired. And he's like, ah, I don't know about that. So she uh, steals his old garden gnome that he's had in the shed for a while and uses a stewardess friend of hers to take pictures of it at certain like famous locales around the world. And when he receives the latest photo and you see that he's got like this whole board on his house of just all these different photos of gnome in different locations. And this time he's at like an old temple. And he's just like, I just don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end of the movie, he does finally get it. Yeah, him and then him going to the, the closure airport. at the end where you see him saying, International Airport. And you're like, oh, he is finally going to travel. Go get his gnome back. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did return the gnome. She did return the gnome. Yeah. I like to think he actually took the gnome with him, though. That was Might have been luggage. in a suitcase or something. Yeah, exactly. I, I like to think he took it with him. Nice. Made more pictures. Nice subtle stuff there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, this movie is like both restrained and melodramatic in the best of moments for both, and uh, it was cute. I really enjoyed it. Yep, same here. Same here. Yeah. I love this movie. All right, so it's February. Love is in the air. Valentine's Day is tomorrow, and Galentine's today is uh, today. So you know, everyone have a good couple days enjoy the the superb owl today the superb owl is today. if you're in the u.s if you're yeah. outside the u.s you have no idea what we're talking about <laughs> and i just made a very obscure what we do in the shadows joke so um yeah but you know uh february it is also black history month oh and there's a comedy that is an examination of a very popular subgenre and a deconstructive, almost, well, just a straight up parody of the genre that Aaron has never seen. A film that Richie and I are quite fond of, that I love both the score, the acting, and the everything of. Join us 
won't you, right for the end of February when we will be covering Black Dynamite. Yes! Yes! <laughs> You're going to have to edit that one, buddy. I don't care! Uh, he refuses to. It's fun. Oh, wow. We're in for a ball, folks. You magnificent bastard.